Hey guys, before we dive into the show, I wanted to tell you about the perfect trailer queue blueprint, which is 100% free and you could download it right now over at thetrailermusicschool.com forward slash blueprint. Now this blueprint will help you to completely understand the structure of trailer music, how to build tracks that will be more licensable and have more impact and capture the right people's attention. So whenever you start writing a cue, make sure you've got this blueprint to hand and you can use it to help speed up your process, feel more confident that you've crafted a well-structured trailer cue before you send it off to that publisher or editor or supervisor. Okay, let's get into the episode. With one microphone. Welcome to the Trailer Music Composers Podcast. Hey guys, and welcome to another episode of the Trailer Music Composers Podcast. In today's episode, I interview an incredibly talented musician and businessman, and also one of the Trailer Music School students. Richard Graham, thank you for joining me on the show. You're welcome. Thank you for having me. It's awesome. Huge yeah, privilege. Well, well, dude, I'm really, really excited. Um, so before we dive into the, into the meaty questions, why don't you start by introducing yourself and telling the audience, uh, you know, what you do, who you are, etc. Cool. Well, my name's uh, Richard Graham. Uh, I've been a digital nomad for 20 years, but uh, right now we're living in a castle in Italy, which is interesting to say the least. And uh, I, I run a Harvard research program uh, for schools where we're trying to change how education is done in the world. So we want kids to be more energetic, more, more mindset, getting them great results as well. And a big part of that is using music. And uh, over the past 20 years, we've helped uh, millions of kids and well, hopefully helped millions of kids and thousands of teachers uh, around the world in every country but one. So um, that's pretty cool. Wow. Um <laughs> There's a lot to unpack in there for me, uh, you know. Uh, so first of all, I'm going to go through the first thing. Uh, for those who don't know, can you explain what a digital nomad is? Because, you know, you know, it sounds like a wandering computer. Yeah. <laughs> it just means that, um, yeah, thanks to computers, well, yeah, computers and everything now, uh, we can work anywhere. So um, I used to be a teacher and um, I started um, doing what I'm doing now as a teacher and fixed in one place. My contract finished. I was invited you know, around the country and around the world to do uh, workshops and things. And I figured out I don't actually need to be in one place. If, if somebody, if I get invited to Thailand, I can spend another few weeks there to my next thing and live there and just live in different countries. All, even the music side of things, everything except the final mix, mix down check, you can do on your laptop anywhere in the world. Um, obviously, uh, with COVID now, it's a little bit more tricky, hence why we're, you know, we've got one base for now. But uh, it's brilliant. It means you get to talk to people around the world you get to see that whatever it says in the newspapers and things it's probably not very true because most people are awesome around the world and you just get to experience cool things so there you go wow. yeah uh, i encountered the term digital nomad uh what was it about five six years ago uh i think there's the there's a lady she's called the suitcase entrepreneur she talked about it there. there's loads of them there's loads of them yeah. all over the all over the place living it. in lovely countries uh yeah or any country, really. Um, so there's another thing. You, I don't. You, you missed out a little bit, and just introduce yourself about the music side, which which okay. is actually a pretty sort of hefty side for me because yep. uh, I just want to. Uh, Richard was in the community of the Trailer Music School, and he got into a conversation with uh, other people in the community about um, music. So take it away. Sure. Well, um, well, so for my, my main day job is you know, we're trying to fix schools and music is a big part of doing it because um, especially if you're dealing with kids or adults who are pre-literate, then music is the, the best way to get them to remember things. And, and it's about, you know, remembering things that they have to do for their tests and what the teachers ask them to do. But also we use music to change their mood and everything like that. So every lesson that we have um, has a song to go with it so that kids can remember the entire lesson and um, and have fun and we can get them a lot more, more energetic. Too many kids hate school. They find it too boring. So we can make it more, you know, using the music to get their mood better and get them more energetic, more passionate, changing their mindset all through using music, uh, which is, is, is the most powerful tool we have. 
So I've been you know, music producing since I was 11 at school. And, um, and yeah, this, this, is, this is a huge part of what we do. Probably the biggest part. Okay, amazing. First of all, I love it. Uh, when I used to teach, I used to try and it sounds really lame, but when you when I say it, it's not that I sort of go in with a hip hop verse or anything like that, but you know, I try and sit, teach the kids basic things through pentatonic songs, you know, simple songs, so that you could they could sort of understand stuff. I, I can't say it worked, but you know, it was fun for all involved. Really? <laughs> no, no, no. As in, as in, like you know, I feel like it worked, but you know, that's because I'm hugely biased. Uh, so, uh, right. So let's let's jump back. Eleven year old Richard. Um, okay getting into music so is this your earliest creative memory or is this sort of the beginning of the career really uh well i actually i've heard your your previous podcast which are actually awesome the other guests have been really amazing so far i think last podcast i was on i was in between stephen fry and and um, neil gaiman and uh, so it's good to be in just as good quality wow. company on this one so i know you'd ask the question before so i was thinking back to it and i always think my first creative sort of moment with music was like with a ZX Spectrum computer and just a basic two note polyphonic um, sequence of thing. And I just figured if you put random notes in there, it sounded amazing. Uh, it was Because I'm, I'm not a natural musician at all. I'm not one of these. I'm not one of the people who are lucky enough to be able to, you know, there's a friend of my brother's, he listens to a track, puts his t-shirt over his head and then plays it on the piano in full perfectly. I'm not anywhere like that. Um, but I love sounds. I could spend all day playing with a Moog filter. And, um, so yeah, so I was with the sequencer doing that. And then I figured if it's not just random, then if you can figure out the root note that corresponds uh, to the melody note. And I think actually what they're teaching me in school actually might be slightly useful then because I could figure it <laughs> out, you know, if, if you can figure it out, that's good. And then, so I just went on doing that and doing more stuff, but obviously very limited budget wise, ZX Spectrum. Uh, Okay. But I just think before that, before I started creating music, when I was even younger than that, I had a tape recorder and I would, um, and I only just thought of this listening to your other podcast, because I used to tape record all my favorite kids TV tunes, because that's the music I used to like, you know, pop songs, when you're like nine and 10, you know, all the love yeah. songs and stuff, you're not really into that, but kids TV shows, and I would, I would record them and, and uh, chop them up and things like that, which was pretty cool as well. Wow. I never got that far. The furthest I got was... Uh getting a, a cd of uh, all the classic classic uh, tv themes you know rainbow transformers you know it was it was <laughs> rocking <laughs> i never got as creative as you with it i you know obviously i was on a cd so chopping it up didn't really have the same effects <laughs> yeah well and I think you, you had cd we didn't have cd i'm, I'm yeah. probably a bit older than you so we didn't have cds then so it was a, a you know like people used to do the top 40 and record the songs so I used oh, to oh the, yeah yeah, the, yeah. I used to do it, it was like, see, skip the BBC announcer and go, okay, pause. And then just before the episode starts, pause. And then get you <laughs> back that way. So. Amazing, yeah. amazing. Um, yeah, this, the, the thing is also, it's quite nice to talk about the sort of early computers uh, because I think, well, for me, early computers had a huge impact in my approach to a lot of things, actually, creatively. You know, uh, I can't remember exactly which computer it was. Uh, I think it was called um, an apricot. Oh yeah, uh, uh, yeah. That's a long time ago. We used to play this game called Roland in Time, and it was just you know it was just like amazing classic chip tune. Like yeah, not 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 Koji Kondo jazz chip tune. You know you know really like basic, but I loved it. I absolutely loved it. So okay, so going back to your you know obviously you sort of dove into this exploration of theme tunes and things like that but then later on you realize okay maybe the stuff I can, they can teach me at school is actually useful which is a very handy realization to have <laughs> and yeah it, it was at the time i know i see now looking back on it it's uh it's i think i feel it's very it has been very limiting um because um yeah you know, I, I did so i did a level uh, well i so I, I did yeah i going through school you know 11 you're starting off i did, I did a level music and I was the first person in the UK to do it with the synthesizer as my instrument, which was pretty cool. And so that's what got me into the whole education thing. Because when I was 16, I was looking for someone to teach me how to play synths properly for the A-level exam, which is the exam everyone takes at 18 in the UK. And, um, and around me, all the teachers were just so boring and old-fashioned. They were like, oh, I don't know. No, one must, one must master the piano before one can touch that plastic nonsense. And, oh, no music has ever been written for the synthesizer. And I'm like, dude, if you don't listen to the top 40, it's all synths. It's like, yeah. cool. So I was like, 
if I want to learn this and learn how to play it properly, there must be other people. So when I was 16, that's when I started teaching music and just teaching kids and, and adults. I my first student was an adult as well. Um, how to, how to play, um, you know, play keyboards, play synths and keyboards. And I did it in a similar way to you. It's like, I, I was like, you know, scales and things. Okay. You might need them technical, you know, maybe there's a case to be made, but I'd rather teach intervals using Star Wars themes or Star Trek or things like that. And so we would, I'd ask the kids and you'd say, what's your favorite song? And they tell me, and I eventually figured it out. I could, any, any song you could arrange in a way, even if it's in change it to C major, even if it's only the melody, you could actually arrange almost any song. So any person could play it in an hour to their satisfaction. So they were happy and going, listen to this, Axel F, wow. And they get the first three <laughs> notes. But you know, you're like, yeah, they're happy with it. And you can build on that um, using the music they know. So yeah, but then when I went to A-level stuff and you're doing you know, eight years of harmonizing Bach chorales, and I, I feel now it really limits my harmony because my, my go-to is, you know, boring. <laughs> I don't say boring, Sparks awesome, but you know, yeah, not very. It, 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 it does limit me, and I can't. I, I feel naturally I can't experiment as much with coming up with cool sounding stuff. Like if I'm trying to write a trance track, I find it really difficult to get this balance between like major, which sounds too cheesy, and then minor, which sounds too um, down. And I, I, it's difficult to find a balance that sounds cool and credible, that's uplifting as well. Um, yeah. But, hey, that's probably practice. No, I think. I think the thing that I mean that's actually a really interesting issue to raise because there, you know, I've spoken to so many musicians that when you sort of go down a route of learning, your brain then goes, ah, oh, so these are the given structures of music. So you know, for me, not that I have done it much recently, but you know, stepping out of the three act trailer structure. Uh, you know, really have to push it hard to get out of it. Uh, but it's it's really interesting, isn't it? Um, yeah. So you know, are, are there any are there any things that you have found that, that have helped that process? Well, well, actually, I mean, I mean, the, the trailer music school definitely helps, and also the free protege uh, modules you put out in the beginning as well. They really help because um, so well. So after well, after I finished my A levels things, I went I went to Japan. I was teaching there, and then as I say, I figured out you know the kids were bored with lessons trying to figure out how they can remember stuff for the next lesson. So that's where I came with the idea of teaching using music, teaching other subjects using music. Yeah? So I've been doing that for the past 20 years. And all the songs that I do for that have to be super uplifting, super energetic. Because you know, if you play a, a group of 30 kids or even teenagers a, a, a really sleepy song, they'll just fall asleep for the rest of the day. So the whole thing is it's got to be energetic. And you know what? I do go straight in with the hip hop. You know, if you've got a thousand kids in a school hall and we're just doing a thing we'll whack the hip-hop on they're like wow what's this I'm like yeah but at the end of it they learn it but so for that amount of time I was just doing all these super energetic songs and I also try and make the curriculum a music curriculum so every song's in a different style of music and I was sort of running out I was running out of um I was running out of um like you know different styles and things so that's when I I read about um you know the Prodigy course in computer music magazine and I thought yes orchestration they're going to show me how to do some orchestration orchestra stuff something different um, so then when i joined your course and you were talking about you know don't worry about the the chord sequences and things just you gave some you know pick a chord sequence and just go with it and then that allowed me another avenue because then with the trailer music i could do stuff that sounded dark and heavy and da -da 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 and all this stuff which is cool and so it was a nice balance out to spread out from all the genki energetic music i've been doing uh, and that helped really increase uh, what i can do which is great uh dude glad to be of service you know uh, i think that's uh, one of the one of the things the hangovers from of musical education for me was uh i don't want to say snobbery but you know they're kind of looking down on uh, a given chord sequence uh I, I think it's it's not it's this isn't to apply to all music education because there are some amazing teachers that acknowledge that <laughs> that it's all the same stuff, uh, you know, and it just depends whether you're kind of, you're in dealing with the hangover of the counterpoint rules, you know, uh, that type of stuff. Like you said, if you're harmonizing Bach chorales, there are very strict rules to follow, you know, and it's the same with uh, every type of music. There are strict rules. That's what, how we get sort of state these genres. Um, but no, really uh, happy to help. Uh, I would like to jump back. Because you were kind of like, yes, I was learning, and then I'm in Japan. 
you know <laughs> <laughs> yeah okay <laughs> so okay so so let's say you've done your a levels what next yep. uh oh that's a it's a good question that's another music question so i did my a levels and i had a choice of and i think most of the musicians on here are going to hate me for this but i had the choice between going to the tone meister course in surrey which is obviously one of the big prestigious music courses or doing a degree in physics but being able to spend a year in France. And that was a hard, hard choice because, you know, as a teenager, I spent every penny I had on music gear and every second I had just writing music. And then, and, and then to have this choice, it's like, what do you do? And, and, and I made, I made those two family issues as well, but um, I, I made the choice of thinking, well, I can do music on my own. So I went the physics route and did a physics degree um, in, and then with the year in France and things. You're wincing like I'm about to spit on you, Richard. <laughs> that's, not, that's not the case. <laughs> yeah. And I still don't know to this day whether it's the right, the right, call, the right choice or not, but um, there you go. It's, uh, it is what it is. So, so I did that. And then after I'd been to uni in France, I was like, okay, where else can I go? Uh, big world. And I think I got, I got two options, either go to Japan um, on the JET program or the other country was Sierra Leone. And Sierra Leone just erupted into a civil war. So I'm like, Japan it is. So I went to Japan. What's the JET program? So if, uh, if anyone wants to go to Japan, it's, and you've got, a, you've got a degree, it's the best way of getting to Japan. It's a Japan exchange and teaching program. So you go into Japanese schools and you've still got three jobs. One job is to teach kids. So I was teaching uh, English and science, um, doing a bit of music as well, but mostly English and science. And then you also learn about Japan because being in Japan, not many foreigners around, especially in that time. And you learn about Japan. And then the idea is you go back to your home country and you tell everybody how awesome Japan is. And then it raises Japan's profile in the world. So uh, it's a JET program, J-E-T. Nice. It's highly recommended if you want to go to Japan. Awesome. Okay. So teaching science and English, a little bit of music in Japan. Where? Yeah. Where next? You know. Well, so, so I, as I, I went in the classroom, um, I've been teaching since I was 16. So I was revved up, you know, thinking, you know, we can teach cool stuff. We can do some, you know, Star Wars and it's going to be brilliant. And we're going to teach all these kids all, all, how to be, you have to think with English and, and, and obviously science, we were doing like NASA science projects. And with English, it's a gateway to the world. And I was like, yeah, super excited. Turned up there. Um, it, it's Japan's like formal. So I was in a suit and a tie. I went there. Uh, the high school, the school's weren't open yet, so it was still summer holidays. So they put me in a kindergarten with 30 kids with a suit and tie on in the middle of Japanese summer. And I was like, oh, blimey, this is a bit crazy. <laughs> so I very quickly learned um, how to uh, navigate that using, you've got to be Genki, Japanese power of Genki, which is fun and excitement. And then, and then so when I got over that, when I went to, went to the schools in September, I was expecting them to be super Genki and exciting. And all the kids were asleep on the desks because uh, Japanese kids study till like 10 o'clock at night. And then um, at private schools, and then during the day in government schools, it's sleep time basically for too many kids. And so I was trying to teach, and it was so boring. So I was like, okay, how can we, how can we do this? And I was trying games, and we were doing, you know, movies and all this cool stuff. And then got them a bit excited, and then we figured out they were forgetting everything for the next lesson. I was like, how do they remember it? Um, and and I'd be, I was doing music on the side, you know, with friends and everything, we're making songs and albums and stuff. Uh, the Japan scene for music gear back then was fantastic. But uh, so I was trying to figure out how the kids are forgetting, forgetting everything. I was like, okay. And then one day I was in the shower and a Japanese song came into my head from the karaoke the night before. And it just happens to be a song about directions of the compass. And I was like, Higashie, Nishie, Minami, Akite. And it's in the shower. I was like, dude, I know this. Word. I remember them from last night. I was like, that's the key. Because I've been doing you know, about pop music and hooks and, you know, yeah. making earworms and how to do that. It's like, if I can make an earworm, with the target of lesson what I'm doing today, I can play it to the kids, hammer it into their head all week on the school PA system. They're never going to forget it for the next lesson. So that's what I did. And I must have done it really quickly because I wasn't late that day. I jumped out of the shower, straight to my studio, uh, wrote a song, one minute, all the target language. It was an English lesson. All the target language I wanted to teach that, that, that day. Played it to the kids, full volume, max, got them jumping, dancing, gestures for everything. So you get the physical interaction as well. Got them singing it really loud. Played it on the school PA every week. And the week later, I was like, okay, okay. Did they remember it? And they remembered everything. And I was like, that's it. So every lesson in my curriculum, I made a song for, 
And that went through. And then I started people asking me how I did it and what I was doing and why my kids were so into it. So I started doing workshops in the local area. And then people started asking me workshops um, in different areas. And then a mate of mine had a 1975 Volkswagen camper van. So I said, do you want to, after, after our teaching contracts finished, said, do you want to take a trip from the south of it? This is the plan. I'm going to take a trip from the south of Japan all the way to the north. We're going to pass every school we see, and we're going to go in and say, on our way back down, would you like a show for your kids? And we're doing all these songs and stuff, and a workshop for your teachers to show them how we do this. And we did. We went all the way up to the top, and then all the way back down. We um, went to all the press offices, got all the local newspapers, uh, got all the local TV shows, and they were all coming to check us out. And then eventually we got in the national newspapers and national TV. Um, and that sort of became um, the... the the big, I, I was just wanting to do it as you know, to get it out there to help te- help kids, not mm-hmm. necessarily helping teachers, but helping teachers was how we did it. But helping kids get a be more energetic and learn more. And um, so I, I did that. I put the songs originally MP3s for free on the internet. This is year two thousand. Uh, nobody had an MP3 player. Um, this is <laughs> Japan. It was back. so. And everyone's saying you're gonna make CDs, and I'm like, well, I don't really want to make CDs. That sounds a bit complicated and hard, but. I thought, well, actually, okay. And so I did. So I made, I made CDs and we got um, your box of, if when you get your first, your first boxes of a thousand CDs, it's like, Whoa, it's so cool. Yeah. And then we, so then we ended up selling the CDs and that, so that became my job then because it got, we got income in. And then I made another CD and then people started asking me in different countries. I went to Thailand and Europe and different places. And that's how it sort of spread around the world. And then we ended up selling the CDs as the business model that transitioned into selling downloads. Um, and just now the big challenge is now, how do we, how do we change that? Um, as we, as we move, you know, we move from CDs to downloads now moving into streaming with the ridiculously low amounts of money coming from that. How do we keep the momentum going? How do we keep everything funded with the streaming model is what we're looking yeah. at now. Yeah. Uh, was that too much again? No, 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 no. That was, that was awesome. Uh, I, uh, <laughs> I love that you just went, oh, this works. Let's go up and down the country and knock on all the school doors. Not just that, but then also contact press officers. I mean, that's that's really forward thinking. Uh, I mean, you know, that's also PR 101, really, isn't it? Contact the press officers. Uh- <laughs> yeah. And because and the press, I mean, you, you have to do it because it's all about getting famous. And, mm-hmm. and not necessarily big, big famous, but famous for what you do. and. Famous in the people you want to reach. So we wanted to reach teachers. And, and the cool thing about newspapers is, and local news, but especially newspapers is, they, 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 they've got no content. They, they're desperate for content because they have to write something new every single day and fill all these pages. It's not like the internet where you, know, you can maybe just pull in a few fluff articles and things. They have to have a really good newspaper as it was then. Obviously, online's a little bit different, but they have to have new content every day. And journalists always have deadlines. And if you can find out when their deadline is, you know, very often it's 3 a.m. or something stupid like that, but if you can find out when their deadline is and you can get your press release, which you can write yourself. I wrote them all myself uh, in, in Japanese. You can you can you get the press release in front of them right before the deadline. There's a very good chance they'll just print your press release with very few changes. Whereas, you know, if they've got a day to think about it, they'll dumb it down and they'll take all the cool details out and they'll, they'll boil it down to some clickbait. But if they're running short of time, they're, they're more likely just to take what you've done and just go with it and put it up there. And then the coolest thing about the press is that as, as soon as you're in there, it's, it's not that the people who saw it will make a difference. You know, sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't, but it's the fact that you can say you were in there. So you've got the clipping for your website. You've got I had, a, I had, a, I had a, a folder, a plastic folder with all the clippings of all the previous areas we've been in. So I could show new schools and say, look, that's what we do. You know, we're not, not just two guys in the van. <laughs> <laughs> this is what we do. We've we got these photos and things and it's cool. So um, you've got to, if you've got a hook, if you've got something different, then um, that's, that's a tricky thing now is standing out from all the other people. But if you can do that and you can put something in front of a journalist before their deadline, they'll love you. And that's how you build your profile, I think. Yes, uh... That's superb. That's 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 kind of what uh, help a reporter out or Harrow. That's uh, that's kind of what they jumped on, isn't it? You know, all these yeah. journalists in need of uh, either articles or advice or second opinions or quotes. Boom! Website. <laughs> 
Absolutely. It's fantastic. And then you get to say afterwards, you know, as, as seen on. Yeah. Um, yeah, I haven't had anything on the BBC yet, because I think that would be a good one if you could say as seen on the BBC. But we've got Social all the big proof. Japanese ones. Yeah. Yeah. And it's great because we had, like, um, one, one of the ones, the TV show with the girl who was um, in Last Samurai with, with Tom Cruise. Um, so there are not wow. many famous Japanese actress, actors and actresses, but she was in, with Tom Cruise in Last Samurai. And then when she was on TV, she was actually um, teaching using my songs on her TV show. So what? Like, that's, that's so cool. So that's wow. good. Wow, that's we awesome. Got a, yeah, we've got a, like the Japanese equivalent of Coronation Street or, or I guess a Dallas, whatever it is for the American viewers, but uh, <laughs> which was pretty cool as well until it got cancelled. But that was great for a while, yeah. Amazing. Oh, that's so cool, man. So cool. Right. Uh, also, the one thing you brushed over, you brushed over so many wonderful details, which I th- it, which admittedly is hard not to do when you're telling your life story uh, in 15 minutes. Uh, now, you mentioned the word Genki. Uh, now, your website genkienglish.com right so can you explain to us what this is you kind of hinted at it a little bit earlier but i think this is really important because this comes across as your main focus yeah so uh to genki is well it depends how far you want to get deep into this because i know you're into this very it's, it's a very broad word so um uh, genki is um it's a japanese word well first of all it's the japanese word for how are you so if you say to somebody and you say genki they go ah genki it means and it means energetic, full of life. Uh, you're really good. So, for example, I always say to people, if you have two beers, you feel Genki. If you have 20 beers, you ain't so Genki. So. <laughs> well, maybe one so, and a half beers for me, thanks. <laughs> there, you go, there you go. So it's just energetic. So as a teacher, you know, if you walk in a classroom and all the kids are buzzing and they're going, cool, let's do this, it's really cool, then they're, they're Genki class. If they're falling asleep and they're dead, then they're, like, uh, then they're not very Genki. So that's that's the sort of meaning we take with it. And when I was doing my training and my lessons and everything, everyone said, so Genki. So I'm like, oh, Genki. And then we've got Genki Japanese and Genki French and Genki everything else. But um, but it also has a deeper meaning as well because the characters for it are, uh, Ki is the Chinese Chi, um, which is your spirit, uh, like the, it's, it's the force from Star Wars. And Genki is your own personal energy. It's your, it's, it's Gen is the origin of you. So it's your own energy. So, um, it's cool. And then you can, you know, there's all other aspects of that as well. Dude, go energy. into it. You know, you know, I like talking about this stuff. Go into well, the, it. The, yeah, well, the, well, the challenge is I'm, I'm a hardcore scientist. So I'm I physics at uni. So um, I hate it when all these um, pseudo scientists try and they talk about the brain waves, the frequency of your thoughts affects the universe and it's quantum mechanics. And I'm like, nah, it, it's not. It's not. It's psychology. It's, it's not. You have brain waves, but. Quantum mechanics is completely different to your brain. It's to do with, anyway, so, but uh, it's psychology. It's, it's genkiness. It's, if you, your, your body, your mind controls a lot of your body, um, you know, just as you, your mind says to my hand, lift up or lift down, then um, it can control how you, how you feel and how you react. And it's, if you're going into somebody, into somebody's birthday party with an amazing gift for them, you would act differently to if you were going up to a police officer who just caught you speeding or something. And, it, and it's just how you handle your energy. And if you can control that, and you know, our mantra is, you know, think Genki, be Genki. If you, it's optimism is a huge part of it, but it's also about you know, being energetic. And it doesn't mean jumping up and down and going, yeah, all day long. It's a case of, it's posture. If you know, like in the beginning, I was a bit like this. And then now I'm sort of like leaning, when you're leaning in, um, when, you, when you've, you you know, there's the Amy Cuddy study, when you do superhero poses, you get more energetic. And things. Yeah. And then you start looking for, you start attracting that because people see you and they go, you know, with my teaching and things, people look at my materials and they go, ah, I want some of that energy, please. I, I don't want to have to drink so much coffee. So they get attracted. And people who don't like that, people who are like, oh, no, 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 no. One has to be serious and boring. Otherwise, then they, you repel those people. So you get this, you, you become the five people you spend the most time with. So you attract the people around you energetically. So, like attracts yeah. like. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then there's the whole thing, like my office manager, they're into all this chi healing, where they heal with their hands and chi and things like that. And I'm not entirely convinced of that. I think a lot of it is placebo. It works, definitely. Um, but it's, a lot of it is placebo. But then you've got other things like, you know, you've got like meditation music and think when you, on the music side, how music affects your mood. You know, I can play you a track now and make you cry. 
or I can play you a track that will make you sleepy, or I can play you a track that will wake you up just by using the energy in the music. And your music is, it doesn't, music is something that doesn't exist. It's one of these invisible forces. You can't touch it or see music, but it affects how you feel. Uh, and it's the same with your thoughts. You can't touch or see your thoughts, but it affects how you feel and hence how you act and hence who you become and hence what you end up achieving. So Nice. There's a, uh... Just going back to your your part, there's so much I want to jump in there. Uh, I always, uh, there's a one of Jordan Peterson's books talking about posture. Uh, you know, shoulders back, head lifting your head up high. They kind of, they kind of hold your body in the way that you want to feel. So if you want to feel confident, hold your body in a confident manner, and your brain goes, oh, oh, okay. <laughs> I'll follow suit. You know, it's like, it's acting really, isn't it? But uh, it's great. Uh, I mean, it's, it's like with schools, you know, when, when you talk, sit up straight in class, yeah, they, they got it half right, yeah? It's obviously, obviously if, with teenagers, like, you know, if, you, if you've got kids or whatever, or, or, or like teaching, whatever, you know, if the teenagers like this, whatever you do, you're never going to reach them because they're just too chilled back. It's going to be really hard. But if you can get them curious, you can get them excited, you can get them, wondering or, or inspired then they start to lean forward and yeah the shoulders are a huge indicator eye contact you know this versus this and things uh, yeah it's huge yeah there's a, i think you know there is a lot of obstacles internally to overcome you know with that as well you know it's you know it's it's that it's that f wonderful thing about you know your thoughts you know you're talking about uh your thoughts affecting your affecting your physical feeling you know it's and also there's the adage of uh think good thoughts do good actions do good deeds you know that's how kind of this this process of start with your thinking and sometimes it feels like you're controlling a tasmanian devil in your brain <laughs> you know uh absolutely well that's your two two different parts of your brain the whole the lizard brain versus a prefrontal cortex thing. And yeah, because yeah. your natural reaction to stuff is to go into feral um, fear or scared or hate or whatever it is, because apparently it's nearer the, the your spinal column. So the signals get there first, whereas prefrontal cortex takes a little while and you have to, you always have this fight. Um, and I, I, I saw this, it, it's, it's interesting. I, I, there was an interview with Kashmir I saw on a music producer on, on YouTube, and he was saying it's almost like your brain's fighting with itself. And it, it, it is, it's the different parts. So, but yet one of the things is fear. And you mentioned about the newspaper reports earlier when I went to, the, went to press offices and things. It's always embrace fear. I always embrace fear. Um, you, you just got to bring it on because um, going to a press office or a press pool even when they're there or even just telephoning up a newspaper is terrifying. It's just yeah. like, it's like, uh, but you've just got to do it and, and practice it. You know, courage, courage is being scared, but doing it anyway. Um, it's not a case that you never get rid of the fear. The fear is what drives you. And as long as you use it in a constructive way, it's, uh, yeah, bring, bring it on. Um, yeah. And, and then the, the other side of it is things, you, you've got depression and things like that, which are a lot deeper and a lot more difficult. And very often you can't get out of them. You need help for that. But um, for most, most people, most of the time, you know, think Genki, be Genki. Yeah, there's the, yeah, this is not medical advice, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, there's. I think I think her name is Susan Jeffers. Wrote the book "Feel the Fear and Do It Anyway." It's all about practicing to embrace the fear and just do it, because you'd yep. be surprised what happens. <laughs> it is. It's like yeah. It's like when I submitted submitted my first track to the Trail of Music School at Lowe last year, and when you were doing the feedback sessions. Dude, you really need to bring those back. They were so awesome. <laughs> yeah, so I hear. Yeah. Well, I when I because I, I um for so long I've been writing all sort of Genki dance pop sort of music, and I was wanting to get into more orchestral things because they're just as powerful. And John Williams always put me off because I was like, dude, John Williams is just so good. Like, how can anyone go into orchestral music when that dude's around? Because like, you can never do it. But then I started learning reading, doing the masterclass like Hans Zimmer and people like that. And I was like, he's not that good, is he really? It's like, <laughs> it's, 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 can you can you hum any Hans Zimmer melodies? Um, <laughs> I probably could, but uh, I've been put tremendously on the spot. Oh, wait, here's ah, one. Sorry. 
Uh, no, no, that's my music. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So obviously his orchestration, his yeah. sound, his emotion, his storytelling, yeah. totally awesome. But uh, melodically wise, you know, Pirates of the Caribbean, which he, he recycled from Gladiator, which if you've, if you've seen Gladiator recently, they play Pirates of the Caribbean in the middle of that, and it sounds weird. Um, and the Inception, of course. So he's, he's awesome. I mean, he's, he's, his masterclass is brilliant. He's, yeah, yeah. Um, his, his story, his like story orchestration, all that is really cool. So, but anyway, where did I go? Uh, yes, I was going to talk about you guys. Yeah. So then I was wanting to learn about orchestration and I found, I read about in computer music about the protege thing. I did the protege free class, which was amazing. And I produced like a trailer sounding piece of music. And I was just like, how did I ever do that? That's just fantastic. Um, and then I applied for protege and didn't get in uh, the first year. So that was okay. Fair enough. So then last year I joined the trailer music school. Because I saw the ads, and the the course itself is really is amazing. It's it's one of those courses where you don't want to do it all at once. You know, some courses you just want to get through it and like finish it, but yours is like you get so much inspiration from each module. It's like oh, I want to keep a bit for later because yeah. You know. But then when you started doing the feedback sessions as well, that was just like unbelievable. Um, so then when I submitted my first track, it was like ah, I'm terrified. <laughs> but you were very cool with it. So that was that was good. So. Yeah. No. Well. Yeah. It's I. I pleasure to be of, of, of assistance uh and yeah that's one of the reasons why i wanted to teach people is to kind of firstly look under the bonnet guys there's nothing complicated here you know this is something and i'm not belittling myself but this is something a lot of composers can do <laughs> it's like okay guys take the chord sequence and just have fun there we go two minutes 20 you're done <laughs> It is. I, I, see, I, I love the structure of it. I love the fact that you can sit down. Like in the summertime, I was, I was out here on the balcony when it was nice and warm. 6.30 in the morning, sun, sun coming up. I'd sit there until 9.30, three hours, nonstop, no breaks, and just finish a piece in three hours. And I was like, with very few, like if you want to do a movie, you ain't going to finish that in three hours. Or you know, Some of my songs for the teaching spent seven years on them. So it was great being able to do that. And uh, but yeah, and I think the thing with music as well is it is magic. It's, it sounds magical. And then when you know how to do it and you put the bits together, it's, it's the sum is greater than the whole. So you, you have that bit of orchestration with that chord sequence and almost whatever you do sounds amazing. And then it's a case of you know, finessing it. And it's great. Yeah, love yeah. it. <laughs> well, awesome. Thank you. Um, so just thinking a little bit about... Uh, embracing the fear and finding that your your genki energy basically uh do you have any tips for anybody to you know action actionable tips to find that place where they can become genki feel genki you know feel yeah. that flow so um so i think well, there's, so, there's so many things there so i think is is do something so you, you have to be doing something um and you can't you can't just be sitting on your sofa playing PlayStation. Like I, I'm, we're, we're we've just flown back to Italy now, so we're in quarantine for ten days. And um, the temptation is to just sit and and, and, and do nothing. Yeah, it would be. I, I could I could quite happily do that, um, but that's not going to get you anywhere. So the thing is to set to do something, and it's not just like goal setting. It doesn't have to be you know like get a six pack or write a symphony or something. It can be just. <laughs> Yeah, just 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 learn a new skill or, or just something. And then once you do that, it's okay, so okay, I want to do this and I don't know how to do it. Is who can help me? And it's reaching out to people and finding out talking to people, that's how you get a lot of your energy. Because you know, we're talking about the feedback sessions and things. So very often you write some music or something and you're not too sure about it. Is it good? I'm not sure. And you end up doubting yourself and it's getting in your head and then you're dead. Um, it's like the tea bag thing. If you got, you know, if you got a tea bag in your head and it's going round and round, it's just dark and miserable. You have to take it out and get the clear water. And you do that by talking to people about what you're doing, either people on the journey with you or people who are one step ahead, and and just chatting with them. And and so I think getting people around you, getting the right people around you, even if it's only one person, uh, is is cool. And then committing yourself to crazy things. So, for example, when I was learning Japanese, um, I, I got invited onto the local TV. And um, I was like, uh, uh, all right. And so they started it. And obviously, it didn't work in English at all. So I had to quickly learn Japanese. And they kept inviting me back and inviting me back. And then they said, next week, we're going to talk about immigration policy. And I'm like, in Japanese? Ah, how am I supposed to do that? I have no idea how to do it. But I was like, OK, I've got this stupid deadline. I have to go and do it. Um, all I want is teaching the NASA science things. 
teaching a NASA science project in Japanese. And it's like, okay, how do you say neutron spectroscopy and active galactic nuclei in Japanese? And it's like, so I've got a deadline, so got to well, go for it. That's yeah. your song. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, mate, no, that that would be absolutely terrifying, absolutely terrifying. And I have to say, I've, I, you know, I, I read the book Yes Man by Danny Wallace uh, when I was uh, nineteen uh, or twenty, uh, and I was just like, "Wow, I'm going to say yes to everything." And then I, then uh, you know, I missed the message of the book a little bit, you know, because obviously it's like say yes, but learn to say no as well. <laughs> It's yeah, like, yeah, of course. It's like yeah, embracing yeah. the universe and embracing all those things that are naturally coming to you, but you know, well, not not everything. <laughs> Learning yeah. boundaries too. Uh, but yeah, I saw a similar thing. You know, started taking on session work, and uh, I was taking on session work at the same time I was taking my first customs for trailers. So the session gigs were happening in the evening at the same time that I was supposed to be right pitching for trailers. So I, I had to bail on the session work, which yeah. wasn't nice for the people who had hired me, but uh, <laughs> I'm glad yeah, I did, well, he says. <laughs> it is. It's a limit, isn't it? You, you, yeah. When you start off at the beginning, you've got to fill everything up with every opportunity you get. And then afterwards, it's a case of automating or delegating or, or, or rejecting. Yeah? Yeah. And it's like right now, I mean, uh, we, the company runs now and I can, I can be on a podcast for however long this morning. I, I don't actually have to do anything because we've all automated. Uh, everything on the business side which is pretty cool so um yeah um say yes there's many things that scare you and then uh, in a good way and then uh, you know, don't do two crazy things but um and then uh, yeah say no when when you need to and yeah yeah that's, that that sounds so easy <laughs> <laughs> what's difficult about it uh, no no I, it? I i think the difficult thing is knowing knowing yourself enough to know when it's doing you a good thing to say no okay am i saying yes to this because i feel i have to or am i saying yes to this because that feeling i have inside me is actually just fear of it going well you know and that takes a lot of insights or a lot you know i would actually not insight practice i don't don't, well does it does it well maybe i'm I'm not sure maybe i just yeah, I've just been doing it too long. But um, I, th- I think if, if if something excites you, if yeah. if if you could get something like doing the the trailer music stuff, you, you, like okay, it's fun doing it, it's, it's, and it's great to build your skills. But also, you got your thing of like, if I ever did get a Spider Man trailer, that would be the most coolest thing in the world. So I'm gonna you want know, to you want to try doing it. Um, and if it excites you, if the result would really excite you, then do it. I think. Um, um, yeah, but also we can also do a lot more than, than we think we can. Um, but I, th- I think the, the other trap of it is um, if, if you are really, like 10 years ago, I, I had LASIK on my eyes. And, uh, and so I couldn't see for, for a year. It, wow. was like being, it was like being in a swimming pool full of salt. It was like, so, you know, it's like when you're looking underwater. Uh-huh. But it, so I spent a whole year and, and my, my eyes keep, they kept changing every couple of months. So. I had these wow. different pairs of glasses and they never worked. And I, I, so I spent a year um, like not being able to really work. Luckily, I had everything automated. It was great. So I'd go to the gym and things like that. But um, the, the crazy thing about it is that I lost my ability to see, but I also lost my ability to see into the future. Because when I first started off doing Genki English and doing all the business side of it, you know, selling CDs and all this stuff, it always seemed so easy for me. It, it was like, this, this is what you do. It's like, why would you not do like? You know, back in the day, you get in the newspapers, the direct to a website, and you sell CDs, and you can get an income that way that pays for all this cool stuff you want to do. And I was like, that's so easy. Why does no one else see this? Um, and yeah, so and then I, I lost that ability to see in the future, which was crazy. So for a whole year, I was like really depressed. And like, if you'd have said to me, think Genki, be Genki back then, I'd be like, yeah, right, bye, go, go, go. With this <laughs> so that's when you need, you know, professional help or whatever. Like, as you yeah. say, we're not, you know, we're not here to give help like that but i think for people in general if something excites you you think what would it what would you love what would you love to what would excite you what would you love to go into the pub with your mates and say dude look at this look what look what's just happened you know what what make a list of those things you know is it that you want to get you know married to the love of your life is it you want to get a date with the girl or guy you've been looking at for ages is it having a million pound in the bank is it is it you 
getting a number one record. I still want to get a record. I want to get a number one record. I love that. That'd be fantastic. Um, and what, what is it? Make a list of the things that would be totally awesome that really, really excite you. And then keep your eyes open. It's the whole, you know, it's the, you, what you, you program your mind to look for things. And if you're looking for red things, you'll find lots of red things. Um, but if you look for blue things, you'll find lots of blue things. So if you keep looking for these opportunities, uh, you'll do it or you'll hear somebody or you can talk to somebody and, 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 and build up from there. I think that's, that's a really cool thing to do. Uh, that is awesome. Uh, there's two, there's <laughs> my brain. Uh, there's, there's a ton of magpies in my mind right now getting distracted by all the shiny things. Um, so, um, first things first, go, going back to that fear and knowing yourself. Uh, my wife has this, uh, I can't remember where she got it from, but it's a simple question to ask yourself to, to overcome the issue of knowing whether it's something for you. And similarly, what you were saying, does it excite you? You ask yourself, what if everything goes right with this thing? And if that excites you, ding. If that still doesn't excite you, uh -uh. you know, and actually it's really nice to kind of do that as an exercise. You know, this thing that's worrying me, what if it's fine? What if nothing happens at all? And, you know, whatever, you know, it's, it's a really nice exercise because we're all very well practiced at what if it goes terribly uh but um the other the other thing was uh what you mentioned about if you look for for red things you'll see red things if you look for blue things you know as you know i'm very heavy on the uh, <laughs> on the uh uh woo woo energetic side a massive hippie basically um and that's one of the exercises if you know getting into the idea of the law of attraction is looking for things and they will start to become apparent uh, yeah. It's like it's and you know that can be look for a yellow car and you'll suddenly start to see all these yellow cars or look for a business opportunity. All of a sudden, you'll get an email and go, "Oh, I wonder where this will lead." Say yes to this. What if it does this? <laughs> oh, absolutely, absolutely, and, and, and it applies in so many different things. Like we have a thing called a red car challenge, which is like you know you think about red cars all day and then count how many red cars you can see around. And I was doing a video about this, and it's on my schedule. I actually had to video it when I was in Venice. And so when I do my little videos I, on YouTube and things, I, I always try and you, know, you have the background that fits what you're talking about. So I was like, okay, I'll find a red car. I'm in Venice. There are no cars. I was like, how can I? It's like, oh. And just I walked around the corner, and there's a toy shop <laughs> with a toy red car in the thing. I'm like, Dude. But that's the other thing about law of attraction is you've got to be really specific with it because. Mm. I was thinking I'm looking for a red car. I got a red car, but it wasn't the Ferrari or the Lamborghini that I was thinking about being in Italy. Um, it was a toy red car. Yeah. Um, but it's, it's crazy in some minutes. Like I, got a, I was thinking about South America and doing Zooms. And this year, my, my live is off again. I can't travel the world again. So I was like, okay, I need to get more Zoom conferences. And yesterday, a guy emailed me from Peru and says, can, I, can you do a conference? I'm like, cool. And then also last year, we're doing lockdown. The first lockdown, I went back to my mum's. And... I was going at folders of papers, you know, and it's like record company rejection letters. Well, I saved those for later. But I had all these brochures of like keyboards from like the 90s and like, and all these Simpsons stuff, which I would never have been able to afford when I was there. And you know what? There must have been like, I don't know, 20 or 30 of them. Nearly all of those keyboards and synths, I completely forgot I had the leaflets, the pamphlets about them. I'd ended up buying them at some point in Japan without even realizing it. And I was like, I, I own this. It's like, yeah, and that one, and that one. And it's like, wow, it's just absolutely crazy how it works. And uh, But it works and you've got to you know, think about what you want and, and, and keep focusing on that and then you'll get it. And, and it's all psychology as well. It's, you know, obviously, you know, the, the, the woo-woo side of it, but it's also the psychology side of it. Is there's so much stimulus coming into your brain every day. It has to filter out, you know, 99.999%. So it only focuses on what you're looking for. And... Um, you know, you're, you're saying about fear and I can't, you said a minute ago, a lot of people focus too much on what can go wrong. Mm. And I think that's, that's a very much a malaise of being in the West. If, if and sorry, especially, sorry. especially <laughs> English. <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, if you've got a British passport or an American passport, it, you, you rule the world. You can go try, like, for example, you know, if, if you've got um, a, a certain pass my wife can't even visit the uk so you can't visit the uk it's ridiculous she's my wife and she can't 
Um, you know, if you've got certain passports, you can't travel. You can't do this traveling around the world business. You can't do music composing because in some countries, you can't even get a PayPal account or, or a bank account to get paid. Um, some countries are under sanctions and you can't get paid that way. So, um, yeah, so I, there was there's lots of lots of stories like that. But, yeah, you know, we get it, into it, cryptocurrency then, can't we? <laughs> oh, <laughs> I, 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 I'm not into cryptocurrency now. Um, yeah, we talk about investing if you want for musicians. You could talk about that, but uh, yeah, not in crypto, no. Oh, no, I was just thinking about the, the idea that the, the blockchain enables people in those countries to have money directly sent to them without the middleman. Uh, no, but, yeah. because no, it doesn't because the government's control what apps you can put on your phone. And oh, okay. And a lot, like if you sign up for Coinbase or something in the UK, you need to give your UK driving license and all that sort of stuff. Oh, if you yeah. ain't got those documents, you can't get access. So yeah. maybe in the future, yeah. But um, Fair point. Yeah. So, yeah, it's... We are, yes, so yes. the point is, yeah, if we're watching this, we're super fortunate, yeah? Yeah. Um, yeah, we always used to say in 2019, you know, um, it's especially dealing with teachers. Teachers have a hard job, and it's full on every day. So if, 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 sometimes they do get a bit down. And you're like, in 2019, you're like, this is the, you know, it's, it's so lucky to be alive now. No billionaire alive now would ever want to be alive 100 years ago. And, you know, if in 2019, if you had a flushing toilet in your house, you're better off than the kings and queens of France. They never had a flushing toilet in their house. They had a bridge with a hole, you know, even the king and queen. Yeah. And it's like with phones, you know, we've got access to any piece of music ever written. It's not like, you know, I'm reading uh, the biography of Brahms and he was building up his collection of music scores and he had to travel the whole country to get these music scores. Whereas now you can go on YouTube and Mahler's second symphony playing whilst the score moves across the screen. It's like, yeah, every movie, every book, every piece of art, maps of the world, anatomy. And it's every in a few years' time, every single kid in the world will have this in their pocket. And then I would say to teachers, so all your kids have all this stuff and you want to ban it in the classroom? This is crazy. Yeah. Um, but we are so fortunate. And if we, if we, if we realize that we are so fortunate, lots and lots of problems in lots of places. The world is far from perfect. But there are also a lot of people who've um, you've got really worse situations. And like we do a lot of work like in slum schools, like we go to the slums of India where the kids can't afford to go to government school. They can't afford the bribes. They can't afford the uniforms. So the, the, the aunties and things, they, they get around the kitchen table and they do little schools for the kids and they get way better results. But when you, and we go in there and we help them, we give them materials and, and we give them training and stuff. And then you look at the kids, they're just so happy. I've never seen so many kids smiling as, as they are there. And then you go to some of the places and the kids are like, huh, I've gone 12. Why is it not a 13? And it's like, <laughs> dude. But anyway, rant over, sorry about that. No, no, no. The thing is, it's the lesson is there to acknowledge what wonderful things we all have in our lives. And if you can't necessarily see them, you then look for them. I guess that's your red car challenge. You know, look for those things in your life to be grateful for. I, uh, I used to do this little exercise where, I'd say, you know, it's gratitude. You say, okay, well, thanks for this computer. And then you start to think, well, thank you to the person that delivered it to the shop. Thank you to the person who sold it to me. Thank you for the person who, all the people involved in manufacturing it. Thank you to the people mining the stuff to make this. Oh my gosh, there's like thousands of people. I have to say thank you for me having this in my house. <laughs> Absolutely. Um and, and it's the same with every, it's like with, there's a, there's, old, there's a trick in uh, for, for bosses in companies. And it says, when you pay your employees, you always put on like a you know, $1,000 of customer's money. And that makes your employees think that they're not just getting money from the boss, they're getting it from the customers and just that gratitude. And like now, with, when people buy my products and stuff, it's like, when I look at my income, it's not just an income and outcome statement. So we've got this much in and this much out. It's like every single penny there was somebody... Who, who bought the materials and they're going to use them and they like them and things. And yeah. And then being able to write, you know, on the computers and the software and, and, you, and, and it's, it's just amazing. Plus all the composers and everyone who's gone before and made all these. It's, it's fantastic. It's great. Yeah, it is. So. Uh, the world is full of opportunity. Uh, yeah. Yeah, it's very exciting. So um, yeah. I w there's a couple of things I want to I want to go back a little bit because uh, okay. I'm keen to talk about the darker times in people's lives because I think it's okay. it's it's a good way for us all to acknowledge that actually we all struggle with some form of 
mental health in some at some point in our lives. So you mentioned when you had the issue with your eyes and you were really depressed. Um, was there anything that you were able to do to bring yourself out of that? Uh, no. Well, the, uh, I'm, I'm not sure. I'm uh, okay. I'm not a not a health expert, so um, yeah, well, I'm not yeah, sure there's yeah. anything. I'm not sure there's anything you can do to get out of depression if it's real depression. Mm-hmm. I'm not sure. I think it, you just have to wait for it to go away. Um, so this is, is it Churchill who was famous for it is, is living the with black the black dog. dog. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I, I, I'm sure there must be, there must be professionals you can get help with the things. A lot of it is just having the support around you to keep functioning uh, while it's going on. Um, but also you've got um, not just even when you're that deep, but it's being conscious of, like the pressures the, 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 and, and try to avoid some of the psychological pressures that can drag you down without knowing it. Yeah. yeah. So for example, um, like I'm in Italy today and it's a free country. It's we had a power cut this morning and I was running around trying to fix the power cut, but there wasn't anything sinister in that. I wasn't, it wasn't a warning or anything, but three days ago we flew back from Kiev and we were in Ukraine and um I don't, I don't know when this is going out and what's going to happen. Fingers crossed nothing will happen. But the American embassy were evacuating uh, staff. So we thought, OK, we, we should probably get out of here right now. So, so we left. But, and before we left, um, Kiev was going on as normal. Everybody was going to restaurants. They were enjoying life. They made the most of it while we got it. Yeah? And, and, and they, were, it was, it was, it was, they were acting normal. Everyone was acting normal. And, and it wasn't until I arrived in Italy on, on Monday afternoon, and I was driving down the motorway from Milan, and I was like, for the first time in a few weeks, I was like, okay, I don't have to worry about not having petrol in the car. I don't have to worry about do we have enough water? Do we have enough bags of rice? Um, now I've arrived in Milan, that, that worry has gone, not, not worry, because I don't worry, but that thing in the back of your mind has been taken away. You don't have to be concerned about that anymore. And like this morning, we had a power cut here in Italy, and it's because we live in a... Oh, 600 year old castle. It's not because something's, there's a, there's, you know, the, the electricity grid has been taken down in t- t- anticipation of something. So um, be, be conscious, maybe look at if, if there are things in, in the back of your mind or there are things in your situation that you don't realize they're dragging you down, but they could be dragging you down. So obviously, COVID is, is one now um, you know, with the, the, um, the situation now and things. But if you can identify those issues and see them just as small strands and then you can focus in on them and mitigate them as much as possible, then that takes away, I think, some of that negative feeling. And then you can say, OK, I've, I've sorted that out. If, if this happens, we've got this in place. Uh, like when COVID first started with schools, you know, we've dealt with pandemics for a long time and like with SARS and things like that and business has been shut down. So we were like, okay, make sure all the schools we work with, they all have six months of operating capital. Uh, everyone's got three months of food in the house. You got three months of water. So we were all cool with that. So we knew that, okay, if that, anything happens, we're all, we look, that's sorted. And then we can get back to looking at the positive stuff and uh, what are the positives in this and how can we move forward? So I think, yeah, um, if it's real, if it's proper big, real depression, then it's, it's, I'm not, I don't know if there is any way out of it other than having people around you to support you. But yeah, if, if look, at, look, at, look at the things that might be dragging you down, that might be emotionally dragging you down and either mitigate them, uh, change them, or if you can, uh, or um, yeah, put things in place where they're not going to have such a serious effect. So. Uh, that's some excellent advice. Uh, on the depression side, there's uh, Matt Haig's written an amazing book. I'm, I, was just, I was just looking left and right because I'm trying to find it on my bookshelf because I've forgotten what the name of it is. Um, I, it's I How to Survive or something like that. Um, no, I can't see it. Someone will, someone will tell me when, I've, when this goes out. <laughs> uh, but yeah, look up Matt Haig and Depression. Uh, he's got a great book on it. Um, oh. And yeah, and living with it. So on that other side uh, of uh, sort of looking at those things that are weighing you down, uh, I think that's really interesting. It's kind of like taking the Boy Scouts approach of being prepared. Um, and also understanding what are those nagging tasks? What are those nagging things that you're avoiding? Because it's like you said about embracing the fear. <laughs> try Just try this, guys. If, if there's like a nagging task that you're scared of, scrap everything else that day and do that one thing and then take stock of how you feel. It, it will, it lifts you. 
so much it's like accounts you've done the accounts you go ah oh, yeah that's the business you know now i can enjoy my life you know <laughs> welcome to our january yes <laughs> yeah that's it yeah yeah um wow i mean that's that all sounds tremendously stressful this stuff in kiev um yeah, but what, what you learn is that humans are resourceful that yeah we really hope nothing happens but after traveling around the world so much you you do uh, see um yeah, you, you see you see how fortunate we are in the in the West, and you also see how how humans can deal with incredible. I'm not going to go into all the stories and things, but uh, yeah, we've seen a, a lot. Well, I, there's one one thing. Well, it's one. Okay, I don't know if you got time. You're okay for time, but and um, so I was once in Thailand, right? And we were doing a workshop, and we said to the, the head headmistress, we said, "How how will we know which is your school?" So we're driving along, we're taking a minibus, you know, a big bus of all the teachers. Go to the school, trying all the stuff we do on the kids. Because uh, we want to see the kids' reaction. It's okay for me teaching teachers, and they all go. Mm. But if they can see it with the kids, you know the little jokes and musical jokes, and see how. Yeah, so that's cool. So he said to the teacher, "How, how will we know it's your school?" And she said, "We'll go along this road. You'll know it's our school because our school uh, has got a skeleton of the headmaster on the wall outside the school." <laughs> and we were like, uh, uh, "What?" <laughs> and she goes, "Yes, yeah, because she says we're near the border with Cambodia." Uh, the, they mined the whole area around the school. We keep telling the kids, don't go out of the school playground. Don't go. And of course, if you tell a kid, don't go out of the school playground, what are they going to do? They're going to go out of the school playground. So one day the headmaster went out to do some farming or gardening or whatever outside the school playground, trod on the mine, got blown up. So they put his skeleton on the outside of the school to um, remind himself, to remind the kids, don't go out into the playground. Wow. So, okay. So, so that, that's yeah, but they were happy. But the Thai people, they're happy and smiley about it. They're like, okay, we've got, we've got to, we've got to be, you've got to be, yeah. And, and then I went to India, and we're in the slums of India, like with no clean water, raw sewage flowing through the streets, uh, kids with playing with you know cans and things like that. I was telling it to a teacher there, and and the teacher, the head teacher at the school in, in the slum area, she was like, wow, that is that is just, I am so grateful. I, I feel you know feel. Not, not sympathy, I can't remember the word, like empathy. Like she was, she was really upset for the teachers in Thailand. And she was, I'm so grateful I'm where I am now because of that. And I was like, wow, in the middle of a slum in India. It's like, well, and they have an expression that says, um, I used to, um, uh, I, I, can't remember what I, I, I used to be upset I had no shoes until I met the man who had no feet. And you're like, wow. Um, and uh, yeah, you, when, you, when you hear things like that from people in really adverse situations, you realize that humans are incredibly adaptable and incredibly amazing as well at you know, being able to get over these types of things. Or well, not over, but coping with them, yeah. shall we say. Yeah, no, I, I, I completely agree. I think this is the importance about traveling and exposure to other cultures. Because uh, you then go, oh, wow, especially... For us, people like us, you go, oh wow! <laughs> like, like you say, I am actually literally living like a king or a queen. You know, <laughs> uh, actually, it's really interesting what you say about the the skeleton. My wife and I were talking about the sort of the ancient Stoics that do this all this like meditation practice in the mornings, where they'd say, "What happens if the worst?" This is going against what I'm talking about earlier. On. What if the worst thing happens? And the reason they were doing that was so that you could then, so what if, what if this person dies today so that you then start seeing them for how they truly are? You go, actually, I would miss them terribly. And then you're, you're, it brings you back into the moment. I think that's the idea of it, but uh, yeah. yeah, I see how that skeleton would be an excellent <laughs> like lesson and deterrent, it, you know? It, yeah. I mean, that, I mean that that is a very powerful technique, and actually, the the real the real way they, they they even go a bit deeper as to what they talk about who dying and things. But yeah, I mean, it, it, but you do have to have the balance. You can't just have that because if you just think that, you, you're going to terrify. It's like now I'm really conscious now that we've talked about maybe some things that are really deep, and if people are listening to this on the on the podcasting, blah, I'm just not listening to that show again. But um, <laughs> you've got to balance it out with the positive. So you've got to think what's the worst thing that could happen. And plan for it, yeah. So you know, we left. You know, in uh, on Monday, it was like, okay, all our spare cash, we're leaving it with people there. We make sure the cars. We left the cars. We were full of petrol. So we we try to do as much as we can. We, whenever I'm traveling, I've got evacuation plans. 
Um, you know, if, if I'm in Tanzania or somewhere and, you know, I've got to make sure, always have spare credit cards that you can always get a flight out. So I'm always paranoid about planning for the worst so I, I can do it. Um, you know, especially with finances, you make sure you've always got spare money for a medical and things like that. Um, so you, you always do that. But at the same time, plan for the worst stuff, but then really look at the focus on the big stuff. Look out the front of the car, you know. Look on the in the in the rear view mirror to know what's there and plan for it, but keep your eyes on the road in front and not just the road in front, but the road in front of that and road in front of that. So you can keep going forward. And it's it's this balance of don't let that dominate, let the forward thing dominate. Because if you try driving your car and you're looking in the rear view mirror the whole time, you ain't gonna get far before you crash. Um, but if you've checked the rear view mirror and then you look forward and you focus on the middle of the road and whatever obstacles there are there. You think, okay, I can get around that one, get around that one. I need help to get around that one and other people to get around that one. That one's not get aroundable. So we'll go a different route and be flexible, like a, you know, trying to get to where you're going to go. If you keep your focus on the road in front, that's and all the opportunities that are out there. I mean, you look at the pandemic and things, and you know, especially in the online world, you know, it's like knitting teachers making, you know, doing $1.8 million worth of knitting courses and uh, like with online music it's I, I didn't really I, you wanted to talk about YouTube and things but you know I've got friends who you know do YouTube and they got like billions of views on YouTube through through songs um, which uh, most people think is not possible but it's like they're just they're just mates they're just normal normal musicians who put songs on YouTube and they can do that and there's so many opportunities lots of opportunities get closed down like your know, websites tend not to work but now social's great you know Facebook doesn't work certain demographics, but now TikTok's great. And as long as you keep this balance, but keep the focus on the front, I think there's tons of things to do. I uh, yeah, excellent summary there. I, I I have to say that I think we've been actually consistent with our discussion because what we what we're essentially saying is, you know, it's all about positive action. Even when you're talking about the worst, you take positive action to deal with that. And focusing on, you know, what, like you say, going forward, but focusing on gratitude as well. You know, yeah. be, you know, there's, there's, when, when we talk about law, law of attraction, you know, the, I think from my experience, what the one of the most powerful one is being grateful for the thing that you are, air quotes, hoping for as if it's already in your hands or as if you've already got it. So it's, it's that positive action and gratitude. And I think that's a, very very powerful message yeah um, and, and that and community and getting the people around you to who think like that as well so you can go forward together yeah. which is another reason i love all the, the trailer music stuff because the, the 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 musicians in there are actually are all super cool people who are like really supportive and helping each other out and you're like this is just an amazing uh, community of people whereas when i was at school doing music Everybody was like, what, 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 that's not a real, real instrument you're playing there. And oh, oh no, that music. <laughs> it, was, it was written beyond, uh, in the 20th century. That can't possibly be real music. And you're like, okay, okay. Uh, whereas if you've got the community of people who think like you do, and, and, the, and that's what's cool about you know, this, this show. And, 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 the, 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 and the cool thing with virtual now is that you can build these virtual communities of friends and masterminds and things from people all around the world. And it's not just who happens to be in your local village. You know, Ed Sheeran's got a, a house down here, but uh, he's not here that often. So, but you can, uh, you know, you can be online and you can listen, get podcasts and and YouTube videos and communities and masterminds and really build that community. So you're all thinking like that. And, and very often the things that you're worried about, the things that you're concerned about, like Brexit has been a total nightmare for me. It's ridiculous. But, um, and there'd be things you'd, you'd be like terrified. You're like, I can't drive next week. What, what, what do I do? I live in the middle of the countryside. And it's like, so you're like, hell, and you find somebody who's done it and they say, okay, you do this, 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 and this, and then you'll be able to drive for a few more weeks. And like, <laughs> problem solved. And so, yeah, that's, that's awesome. Uh, I, I couldn't agree more to be honest. <laughs> I, I think the, the internet and seeing the positive things that people can and are achieving through consistency uh so uh, and also i think being true to themselves which actually is really hard to do when you're in a school <laughs> i think being true to yourself when you're a teenager is very difficult or can be anyway um but i would like to jump into uh segue i i haven't we haven't really talked about like what you are 
most proud of in your career? I mean, there's still loads of things I want to cover, but I don't, I'm not sure we're going to have time. But uh, <laughs> let's let's go into the thing you're most proud of. Uh, I do. I am very keen to talk about musical investments. You mentioned that, and I'm like, oh, okay, oh. yep. Okay, so let's go into the proudest moment in this uh, segue. Okay. Dude, but that's an interesting question as well, because you've asked this to other people, and it's like, it's an interesting question to ask, because pride is always seen as a negative thing. It's a, um, And then also, and the previous guests were all talking about people, and you went, oh, that's so good that you're not thinking about things, but people. And I was like, oh, dude, I'm going <laughs> to... <laughs> yeah, I'm but, super uh, proud of my easy. old castle house. No, uh... <laughs> no, nah, nah, this is... Nah, nah, um, nah. Well, I, I think the thing for me, pride-wise, I think when I was thinking about it, people, yeah, it is, it, pride is about people and the people you help. So I am... I'm, been in the education space yeah we've been in this 20 years so many kids we've helped and they've had a and we get emails from them messages from them now and they're saying i, I used to end up liking school i love school i loved that lesson i hated everything else but i loved that one uh, and we get people getting married as well as a result of uh, learning the languages and things and then traveling and getting married so i'm like that's pretty cool but yeah. i think um as, as some inspiration maybe for beginner musicians or people who are just getting into it one of the, one of the proudest uh, moments i had was well, apart from all the euphoria moments, like you're know, getting on stage with a thousand people, you can't beat that. That's, but that's a whole different thing. But the pride wise was I remember when I bought my first car from my music and the 1975 Volkswagen camper van blew up <laughs> like, on the motorway. We, we went on back roads the whole way. And then just the final stretch home, we went on the motorway and it blew up. So um, I, I did. So I had to buy a car and it was only a $500. It was in Japan. So cars are cheap. $500. Uh, Honda today, a tiny little car, so I could put my hands on top of it, white car and uh, shiny. And I was like, I bought it $500 out of the company expenses. And I was like, my music paid for this. I was like, wow. And it's like you said before, you know, music is something that's almost not real. You can't touch it, you can't, it's not tangible. But the, the people that like my music so much, they, they bought me a car. Well, they, you know, they, they bought my stuff and then I bought the car, but you know, they, and I was like, that's actually really cool. I was, yeah. I was really happy with that. So I think that's an awesome moment. Also, I, I don't think, you know, although I think it's good, important to be grateful and proud of the people you have served. I, I don't think it's a bad thing to say, I'm proud of this amazing company I've built. You know, I, I think that's because without the embodiment, without that entity, the service wouldn't be there. So, you know, there are so, you know, that's why I want to know. You know, I don't want, I don't want to set the bar for what people should be proud of, you know, but th I think that's a lovely, lovely sentiment that, you know, it's kind of like, an, uh, you know, you hear about lots of internet entrepreneurs or digital nomads sort of framing their first, I don't know, PayPal receipt or something like that. You know, it's just being like, I can do this. Yeah. You know, I, yeah. It's proof, you know, proof. And, you know, your car was that, wasn't it? But, what I'm doing is is working. Yeah, and and, and, it's, and and I think it's more surprise as well. It's like you know, growing up, it was like, especially being you know the background I was in, where everyone's saying you know my music's not not worth it, it's not real, it's not proper. It's uh, and then to actually like like well, that actually is, is bomb a car. So it's actually quite it was you know it's worthwhile. It's quite cool. So yeah, um, yeah. That's good. Well, that that also segues beautifully because <laughs> you invested into a car. Now let's talk about musical investments. <laughs> <laughs> it's really interesting because actually, yeah. you know, let's play that. Let's play this card. You're an aspiring composer or producer or a musician, and you're a bit scared of starting this business. What if everything goes right and you get all of that money and whatever you want? What if that happens? What are you going to do with your money? Yeah, uh -huh. very good question. So I'm not a financial advisor, and this is uh, not yeah. financial advice. <laughs> we don't play doctors on the internet. So uh, yeah, uh, okay. So what do you do with all that money? So uh, it, it is it is a great um, problem to have, and you know, right now we're struggling with this transition to streaming. So <laughs> it's it's great. So we've we've sold you know millions of dollars of CDs um, and downloads, which is crazy. But we, obviously, we spent it, we reinvested it back into the business. But um, part of it is you've personally, financially, especially if you've got a family, um, need to, it's not financial advice, but in my opinion, it might be a good idea to have some sort of financial security, especially if you're musicians where, as COVID has seen, you can get cancelled. 
um, and just disappears. Uh, AI is coming on board, so we don't know what the future is for uh, musicians and composers and things like that. So it's really important that we have financial um, stability in place and financial freedom in place. So that also as well, you might not be able to play um, if you're a player. Like my, in Italy now, I'm in a t-shirt now because I've put the heating on, but just, just for this podcast, but normally it's freezing and my hands don't move as fast as they used to. So I'm not sure how long I can go on doing this and hearing loss as well in the future. Right? So don't be too pessimistic, but the idea is that you build up your finances so that your finances can take care of you. And you know, there's this whole movement called FIRE. It's like you know, financial independence, retire early. The idea is you save up as, as much money as you can so that then you can retire whenever you like financially. But that doesn't mean retiring from the job. It means you do the job because you love the job, not because you have to get a paycheck. So when that new, new, new you were saying with the options come in, you don't have to say, sell my soul to get this money. It's like, well, I'm, I'm, I've got my income coming in. I want to do this project because it's really awesome. Um, so how do you do it with money? One of the best pieces of advice I ever got was uh, when you get your first paycheck is don't spend it. Um, spend um, as little as you can of it because if it's your first paycheck, the month before you had nothing, yeah? So you were living on nothing or whatever you were living on. Keep that mentality. Keep living on what you were living on before and invest as much as possible of the money as you can. Now, obviously, if, if you're in a really dire situation and you feel you um, have to spend the money, okay, that's a different thing. But um, for most people, if, if you're getting a, a raise or you're getting, an, an, a, say, a new contract, and save as much as you can. Save and invest. Um, and do it in a in a why <laughs> no you don't put it all in cryptocurrency I wouldn't <laughs> but uh, you know put it put it you know, balance it out into your different buckets you got you know in maybe ETFs or something like that American ETFs first and then property and things and the idea is to balance it out so you end up with an income that you could either retire on or you could then do your passion and add to it in the future now the only thing is for most of us in the Western world. The numbers that they're looking at, I think in, in England and America, is you're going to need like $3 million to retire um, because in 20 years' time, the, the inflation and everything. So you're like, dude, how are you supposed to get that? But you can get it through compounding if you start off early enough in investing. So I think the key is whenever you get any money in, you'll figure out what you need to invest in your training because you should invest as much as you can in learning new skills. Um, figure out what you need for equipment, but you know what you need, not what you want. You know, don't go crazy on Black Friday, and then invest as much as you can. Uh, so the idea is then you end up with um, income coming in that supports you, and you don't have to worry about the money. You can do what you love, which is, I think, what we all want to do. Awesome. Yeah, I like that. Um, I like I I I approach, always like to approach it like a landing strip or a safety net. You know, do you have six months of your monthly bills? back banked up just in case you don't land that trailer you're going to get or just in case that song doesn't do as well as you know um so yeah also there's the, there's the ideas of each if you start to get a a, uh, a steady monthly recurring revenue then deal with percentages take this much out for savings this much out for tax obviously this much out for any tithing you want to do and then you know Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. So, there, I mean, I love, I do love talking about this because, you know, as as creative people, we're not, we're not actually educated in <laughs> this type of thing, you know. Yeah, I mean, the tax the tax one is a huge one, and uh, I, I, I moved to Italy last year, um, and that is another reason why I was into the movie trailers so much last year, and, and now is so I moved to, I moved to, to Italy, and of course the tax different different tax situation. And you're looking at the numbers and the way everything was structured for me. I, my tax bill is actually more than my income for last year. I was like, wow. ah, well, fair <laughs> share, okay, but actually my tax bill's bigger than my income. It's like, how does that work? And it's like, okay, so we have to restructure things, and it looks like royalties. Um, earning through royalties is actually a, a lot better in Italy than um, some of the other ways I was structuring things. So that's why I was, I was thinking about okay. Yeah, so if I if I work and I'm doing you know the business side of it and selling things, then um, I get all my money gets taken away. Whereas if I get royalties, then only half my money gets taken away. Maybe I should bring in an extra royalty stream from uh, you know maybe looking at trailers or I'm not entirely sure if that's going to work out, but uh, you know um, maybe looking at that as an extra income stream as along with the investment income streams as well. Yeah, 
Yeah, it's really it's really interesting. And we both recommend you seek your own financial advice on this front. Mm-hmm. Uh, oh yes. Yeah. Uh, um, professional financial advice. Yeah, don't go on the internet and yeah, say, yeah, "Hey, what yeah. should I do here?" It's like, yeah, this is not coming from us. Uh, Okay, I, I do want to talk about YouTube a little bit uh, because, yep. you know, anyone who's everyone knows that YouTube, obviously YouTube as a, as a consumer is amazing. It's, it's like a university degree, basically, in whatever you want to learn. Uh, but as a creator, you know, there's, I mean, this is an entire podcast series in and of itself, you know. How do you crack YouTube, man? Uh, I mean, there are some great... Uh, youtube podcast so you should check them out but uh as a songwriter how did you approach was it just a kind of like throw on the wall and see if it sticks or was it you know intentional seo research or was it you know how did you dive into that okay well how how do you crack youtube really (laughs) simple answer to cracking youtube It's, it's infallible answer it's the answer to cracking youtube is you start in 2007 (laughs) um which isn't really an option for most people right now. But yeah, okay, so how did I, so I, first of all, I'm, I'm probably not the person to be speaking to about YouTube uh, because I've got, I've got like 40 million views. I've got a few songs that have got millions of views. I used to bring in quite a nice income, like you know, a few thousand dollars, uh, like, you know, not, you know, over a thousand dollars a month it used to do before the changes happened. Um, however, I didn't, I haven't really embraced YouTube that much um, because, when I first started out, I was selling CDs and CDs were just such a no brainer business wise. It's you can chat. We charge $40 per CD. It was amazing. And we'd have, it would be in Tokyo with a thousand people in an auditorium and the, the staff would be holding up the CDs and people would be literally pulling the CDs out of their hands. And we were just like, is wow. Awesome? Yeah. I was like, I was like fantastic. So, and, and we'd sell out with like hundreds of CDs and you know, it's like, it's just crazy. Um, and then, then when downloads happened, I was like, didn't go to downloads. I was, I was like, nah, they're too big. Nobody's going to download them. Yeah, we sell them as a set, as a gigabyte. And then we noticed all the piracy and people were downloading on piracy. So we were like, oh, maybe they are. So we switched and we started selling downloads. It worked great. So, but then same with YouTube. So I was, I was getting quite successful and getting quite famous for doing what I was doing. And of course, a lot of my friends were like, we can do that as well. We can write songs like these as well. And what they did instead of producing CDs, because you know, they say that I, I had to set up a warehouse. I, warehouse staff with your order fulfillments and blah 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 they were like we're just going to put our songs on youtube and so i've got at least two friends who've uh, put songs on youtube and they've got over a billion views uh, wow. with their songs and i've got another another friend who's like obviously there's a lot of it you can't talk about you can only talk about things that are public so mm. that's one thing with youtube courses online very often when people talk about hey make a million dollars on youtube it's what worked five years ago because if it was working now, they'd be doing that, not telling you, not selling you a course. But so you, you learn about it from having beers behind the scenes with your mates. So there's something you can talk about, some things you can't. But for example, another friend of mine, he, he made it public that he did 100 million views in September, October, November last year. And these are from kids' songs. So YouTube is, you know, you look at Ed Sheeran and Adele and things. Okay, they've got these huge marketing things. But there's also, you know, the, the, biggest, the biggest YouTube song in the world is Baby Shark. Which is the kids' song? Um, Coco Melon did. I think they did 120 million in 2019 from YouTube for kids' songs. So there's this whole other set of micro niches like kids' songs in YouTube, and if you can hit one of those and get lucky, um, you know the mate who did 100 million views in autumn. He was. I was like, dude, how do you do that? And he's like, pure dumb luck. It's like <laughs> um, you just get picked up. And but there's always micro niches. Like three, four years ago, meditation music was huge, and if you make a, an hour long, two hour long meditation track with ads only at the beginning, you could make a fortune. But of course now the AI has picked up on that and all the meditation tracks and our 24 hour streaming AI meditation tracks. You can't break into that. But if you can find other niches, like every language, language learning, like my Japanese, my songs for learning Japanese are my most popular ones. And you usually find that most people have one or two hit videos that go viral. And then the rest of the channel hangs on those. Uh, it's like Baby Shark. Yeah, how many other songs can you name from Pink Fong? Yeah. Um, I've got other friends who are doing, you'll know, do billions of views and they're like Twinkle Twinkle Little Star or ABC song. They're, they're, they're tent pole songs and then the rest of them fan out from there. So um, it, it comes back to the old hits model. 
of like what record companies used to do, which is you put out as many tracks as you can and then you see what gets traction. And whatever gets traction, you do more of. So for example, I've got another friend who's done over a billion views and he had a song, kids song again. It's the, the Daddy Finger song. It's the, uh, <laughs> I have kids, but we, I don't, we don't really let them watch YouTube except when they re- specifically request Baby Shark. But uh... <laughs> There you go. Well, he, he did that with the, with the Daddy Finger song and he's done like 50 different versions of it. Um, so then if you have a hit, so the, the thing to do is you look for a hit video and then you do almost the same title. So keep the title almost the same. You can look at what keywords do, put the same keywords in and keep a similar description. Obviously, plagiarism, you know, don't copy exactly, blah, blah, blah. And if it's your own track, it doesn't matter. You know, you can, it's like Baby Shark, have the Baby Shark EDM mix, the Baby Shark Monkey mix, the Baby Shark the Lions mix. It's like, you know, millions of different mixes. And so then that's how you build up from there. Um, so if you haven't had a hit yet, is maybe look at some hits and, um, and, and think, can you do your own versions legally if the public domain songs? Can you do a better version? Can you do one in a different style? Um, so like my music's really genki, so that's why I, I wanted to keep it for, um, and we went with the CDs rather than YouTube. We, I've only got a few songs on YouTube, uh, because also YouTube as well is a moral issue of for kids' songs. Is is it's it's the American market is where you're making money, and it's mums who are too busy, and their only option is to give the kid an iPhone with an hour long, and you get these stands you can get on Amazon for babies, and it's the baby and the iPads there, and they're just like wow. and you're like. Not, not sure I want to get into that. Um, but yeah, you, you find out what's popular and see if you can do something similar that's legal, of course, and um, put out lots of stuff and see if you can work from there. I mean, it does seem that TikTok might be the better way now, but I'm, I'm not too sure about that. But certainly, you know, YouTube has got longevity. My top videos, my top earners, the ones I wrote years ago, I've got a Halloween song. They used to bring in like hundreds of dollars every Halloween. I was like, nice, cool, place for all my candy. Um, <laughs> Yeah, so you can you can do that and, uh, and and keeping an eye out for maybe what's underserved and things, but but also in two thousand and eight when my friends started getting big on YouTube, I was looking think oh maybe I should do some nursery rhymes then, and I looked on YouTube and every nursery rhyme I could think of was already on YouTube, and I was like all right it's finished yeah they're already there. there's no point in me doing it and now of course you know no. you see all these <laughs> yeah so don't don't think that I think yeah. we were talking about with the trailers as well it's like you know. It's, you, you think, you know, this has already been done. And like in the Brahms book, the guy was saying, why would anyone write a symphony after Beethoven? You know, it's like, um, Music you, know, you think everything, <laughs> yeah, you can put your own thing on it. You know, you can yeah. do stuff that's already yeah. out there. And, and try and anticipate and look what's underserved and things like that. So. I Epic also, music apparently is huge as well, isn't it, on YouTube? I'm not it, sure. Yeah, it really is. Um, I think also the other thing to bear in mind is that just because it seems oversaturated does not mean it's oversaturated with quality. Uh, and quality shines through. So, uh, and, and also the really important part is, is your own take on that thing is different. I mean, that's, that's just a lesson in creativity, really, isn't it? Just let yourself do the thing you want to do and that is best suited to you and that will shine through. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and basic songwriting things of hooks, 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 hooks. All, all my like hit songs, all the, all the ones that are really popular, have all got a crazy hook somewhere. And if you can put three hooks in a track and a hook in the production, then you know, you, you're set up. But on TikTok, you might only need one. When it's a 10 second song, you might only need it one hook and off you go. So yeah, learn, learn about hooks, how to write the earworms. And- so are you talking about uh, you, the creator uploading videos to TikTok? Are you talking about TikTok being a source of royalties by other other creators using the music? Uh, so I'm, I'm not sure about the financial aspects of TikTok. Uh, I've just been looking at the viral numbers and things. And as I say, I'm not an expert in it. I haven't done it much, but... Um, there's, um, if you can get a track that becomes popular, then you do get royalties from that, yeah? Uh, but more important than that, you get the exposure, yeah? Um, I mean, we all know the little Nas X thing, um, you know, we did the TikTok and then pushing it and then got famous there. So, yes, yeah, so if you are if you write a track and, you, and then other people take it, if it becomes a dance craze, you know, if you can talk to a choreographer friend and come up with a crazy dance thing to a silly little trap music set, I think seems to be the top, you know, maybe that's a way to do it as well. Um, and if you get popular like that, I don't think it'll bring a lot of money in, but it might bring opportunity. Uh, so, for example, with YouTube as well, I had, you know, a few years ago, I had um, uh, somebody from a famous shoe brand 
uh, you know, camper shoes and they're pretty big. No, not the, you know, it wasn't Nike or anything, but, and they're like, we saw a track, we saw a track you did on YouTube and uh, can we use it in a, in a, in an advertising campaign? And I was like, uh, all right. Yeah, <laughs> no worries. Yeah. And then a million and one NDAs and sample clearance forms later. It was like, uh, <laughs> Yeah, I think that's, again, it's that lesson in you don't know when or where opportunity is going to come and what form it's going to take. Uh, so it is a case of just looking forward and following those things that f- excite you. And in your case, Rich, you know, finding finding your Genki energy, what's, what's gets you, what gets you excited? I think it's really important, though, and it's so easy to get sort of bogged down, isn't it? Uh, so, yeah, I think that's a great lesson. Yeah, and, and you're not gonna, you're never gonna. The thing with YouTube is, and, and socials in general, and humans in general, I guess, is you're never going to beat the algorithm. So if you can think, okay, uh, every single like, it's, it's, a, it's a great, it's some great um, talks on YouTube about how to write a hit song, and they talk about, okay, so after 13.4 seconds, you would have the first chorus. The chorus would have these three rhyming couplets, and you would have this. And but if you, as a human, try and copy that algorithm, you'll never beat the AI because the AIs are loaded with all that psychology and stuff. Your only way as a human is by doing something the algorithms can't do. And usually that's, that's an accident. You know, it's like when we come up with great sounds and you go, dude, I, I wasn't planning on that noise, but that sounds awesome. Let's put that in. And it's those accidents and those random things, I think, that are, that are going to make you stand out and, and, and not go down the algorithm route, uh, I think, yeah. It's, a, it's, the, it's the human element, isn't it, that will make you stand out. Uh, Richard, uh, I have so enjoyed our chat. It's been really cool. Um, I just, this is more of a personal favor to me. Um, just those of you who are listening and rather than watching, uh, I don't, you don't fully get the idea of, uh, the expanse of where Richard is living at the moment. So when he used to come onto the train music school calls, he'd do it outside in the street and behind him would be this huge castle. And in one of the calls that came out, oh, this is where I live. Uh, and then we started talking about that in one of the briefs and he started recording sounds for horror music in his in his space. I don't know whether you've picked it up whilst listening, but sometimes when when, when you were speaking, Rich, it, the, you'd hear the reverb. Now, just as a favour to me, can you clap so we can hear that lovely reverb? I, tell you, it's, it, I should actually be in the hallway over there, but if I clap, I don't, I'm not sure if it's loud enough to clap, but... Now, that's a bit damp, isn't it? Hey, it, it sounded good to me, you know. <laughs> I, t- I tell you what I did do. I did do at Halloween when we had the Halloween brief. Yeah, yeah. was um, I was like, because I, I was always thinking you got to pay all this, you got to all this Spitfire, uh, had the what is it damage and all this lot. Yeah. And you were like, no, nah, no, nah, I'm just gonna hit something. I'm like, all right. So I went into the the stairwell and um, and I started hitting the wrought iron. Um, the frame of the thing I was like, okay and finding out the best thing to hit, like, rolling pins work great if you find a castle you find a rolling pin just bash it uh so i recorded a load of those and actually i uploaded them onto the forum in the trailer music uh forum as well so they're they're all there if anybody wants them nice yeah it does sound a bit whoa yeah but and also don't do hall if you're going to record halloween stuff in your house yeah don't peep, don't play people the track on halloween in your house because it absolutely terrifies them when they think it was recorded there they're like what was that? That's... Nice. nice. There we go. Right. Yeah. Do Richard... Christmas ones instead. The Christmas ones they like it because it makes you feel nice and yeah, bright. That's so. it. Yeah. Lifts the mood. Yeah. I think that's the thing. I wouldn't listen to any of my music because it's all terrifying. <laughs> but uh, Richard, thank you so much for coming on the show. I really, really appreciate you taking the time to talk to me and the audience and share your story. It was awesome. Thank you. Oh, thank you very much. Thanks for the pleasure. Good luck, everybody. And if there's anything I can help anyone with, That's cool. Enjoy the rest of the podcast. Enjoy all your music and go and do crazy things.